We're all adults. We all understand the way sexual reproduction takes place. One of the things you hear me talk about a lot is grafting. And I know you're curious about it because I get a lot of questions from you. In fact, lately, over half the questions I get are about grafting. Should I graft my tree? If I plant a tree from seed and I let it grow, will it ever produce fruit, etc., etc.? Well, I try to get to each and every one of your questions one-on-one -on -one and answer you directly. I thought it might be a good idea to put together a video to explain to you the difference between grafting and propagating a tree from seed and why farmers choose to graft our trees. Like most things in life, there's a very simple answer with complicated reasons. We like to graft our trees because, for example, say I like the behavior of this tree. I can take a clipping from this tree, insert it into a baby tree, and make a clone, make an exact genetic replica of the tree whose behavior I like. That's called grafting. And grafting allows me to control the output. It allows me to determine what kind of fruit I'm going to get, how it's going to taste, when it's going to be ready. If I grow a tree direct from seed, I have no control over those factors. Let me explain why. Let's talk about grafting. First of all, what is grafting? Grafting is a process where we take a clipping from a tree and we insert that clipping into a seedling. The resulting tree is an exact genetic replica of the tree from which we took the cutting. Now the cutting we take, that little piece of wood, that's called a scion. And the seedling we insert the scion into is called rootstock. Here's what a grafted tree looks like. On the bottom here, you've got your rootstock. It's coming close right here. Then right here you see the graft. You see where this scion from this tree was inserted into this rootstock and now all this new growth is of the cultivar of this particular tree. Now this is called a Murata and all the attributes I, I, I talk about about a tree are out the window. This was just a novelty for me because it produces tree, uh, it produces fruit with kind of like a purplish haze and so I'm just growing this one just because I want to look at the fruit. <laughs> So this tree behind me really isn't one tree. It's two trees. From the ground and down into the roots, it's one type of tree. And from the graft up, it's another. So me as a farmer, and you as an at-home grower, by and large want the same thing, right? Fruit quality. We want fruit that tastes good. Yield. We want our trees to produce a lot of fruit. Consistency. We want to get fruit every year. Appearance and size. That's probably a little more important to me than it is to you, but I want my fruit to look nice and symmetrical and shiny. I want it to be nice and big. And another one that's, that's a biggie for me, probably not so much for you, is time of harvest. Do I want my fruit to ripen early in the year, mid-year, toward the end of the year? Do I want a grove that kind of, you know, spreads it out so I get some fruit at the beginning, some in the middle, some at the end? So this tree behind me, this is a, this is a choquette, and these, these fruit aren't even near ripe yet, but a a choquette. So let's talk about those properties. The fruit quality is excellent. They're delicious. Everybody down here in South Florida loves these choquettes. The yield for me is absolutely fantastic. I mean, when it comes time to pick, these trees are so heavy with fruit, they're like falling over. Consistency, you can set your watch by these trees. I get a crop every year with my choquettes. And size and appearance, these things are incredible. This, this little guy here, when he's mature in November, December time frame, be two and a half to three pounds. He's going to be the size of my head. And I don't know if you can see it from here, but they have little ridges, almost like a, almost like a pumpkin. And finally, time of harvest. Choquette, as I said, is a November, December crop. It is a late season crop. Now follow me over here, right behind you. This guy here is a, this is a Monroe tree. Monroe, like the choquette, is a late season crop. I harvest it sometime, sometime around Christmas usually. It, uh, the, the fruit quality is very high. It's delicious. People down in South Florida love these guys also. In terms of appearance, these things are a little rounder and significantly smaller than the choquette. They get to be about maybe a pound and a half. But the trees get loaded. I mean, you get hundreds of them on one tree and you get them every year. Monroe is an excellent crop for a commercial grower such as myself. Let's go check out a few others. This variety or cultivar is called Simmons. It's one of only a few early season cultivars I grow here at Sleepy Lizard. It too is absolutely delicious. The fruit quality is very high. I love these fruit. In fact, I only have two 
Simmons trees. So I very rarely sell these to the packing house. Me and my family and my friends tend to eat these things up. It's uh, it's an early season uh, it's an early season fruit, like I said. So we start picking these things in in July, and they're they're known for their size. These things get to be about two and a half pounds. Again, almost the size of my head. And they take on a very pretty pear shape. And they have a nice light green shiny skin. Once again, Simmons, early season variety. This little guy here, this is the Lula cultivar, L-U-L-A. And far and away is my favorite cultivar. These things are absolutely delicious. I don't grow these trees out in the grove, however, because while it's super high in fruit quality, the yield is unpredictable on this tree. I've had years where I've had hundreds of fruit, more than I can even eat. Last year, I only got a dozen. This year, at first count, there's maybe 30 tops on the tree. As someone who needs to make money selling fruit, these really aren't a good option for me. But I do keep this one here in the garden because for me, a life without Lula avocados is not a life worth living. The last of the grafted cultivars I'm going to show you today is called a, a Hall Avocado. You see it here. Like the, the Simmons, it produces a, a beautiful pear-shaped avocado. In fact, this one is even more shaped than the Simmons. But unlike the Simmons, this is a late season avocado. This thing ripens around November, December. For me, maybe Hall isn't as good a choice as Monroe or Choquette for a commercial grower because you don't get as many per tree. The avocados are smaller when they're mature. They're about a pound to a pound and a half. And they're also unpredictable. Some years my hall trees are loaded. Some years some of them have a lot. Some don't have many at all. But I keep them around because I like the flavor. And I, and I just think they're really pretty. You know, if I go over to someone's house, I'll put a box of these together, wrap it up in a nice string, and give it as a gift. Because all of those cultivars I took you through are grafted trees, everything I told you about them will be true year after year after year after year. Now let's talk about growing a tree from seed where, frankly, anything goes. So that was grafting or asexual reproduction. Now let's talk about sexual reproduction, which in the tree world is known as pollination. When a daddy tree and a mommy tree love each other very much, they pollinate to create a baby tree. And believe me, in the springtime, all these trees want to do is pollinate. Pollinate with each other, pollinate with themselves and there's nothing I can do to stop it. I ain't a doctor, I ain't a scientist, but let me do my best to explain pollination to you. Pollination occurs when pollen is transferred from a male flower to a female flower. Generally that's done with a, by a honeybee. You know, the bee's just flying around, landing on flowers, getting his little sap or whatever the heck it is he takes back to make honey. When he's doing that, he brushes up against the male flower and gets coated in pollen and then he flies into a female uh, flower and deposits that pollen and that tree becomes fertilized and produces a fruit. Now avocado trees can be both male and female, which means they can pollinate themselves, but they try not to. They try to have genetic diversity and they've evolved so that when the female flowers are open on an avocado tree, the male flowers are closed. Then the next day the female flowers are closed and the male flowers are open. But sometimes there's overlap in those time frames and a tree can actually pollinate itself. They're, they're self-pollinators. Or pollen gets transferred from the male flower that's open on a separate tree to the female flower that's open on, say, this tree right behind me. Fertilization occurs and a fruit is created. Okay, so far so good. We're all adults. We all understand the way sexual reproduction takes place. So why can't we just take the seed from the inside of this fruit that was created in that fertilization process? The reason is the DNA inside of this seed is absolutely unpredictable. We have no idea what this is going to grow into. On the other hand, I can say with 100% certainty that this is going to grow into a Murata and it's going to give me fruit of the same quality and on the same cycle that its mother tree did, that the donor tree did. Why is the DNA so unpredictable? Well, think about what I just said. First of all, every single tree in this grove is grafted, which means it's got the DNA of the rootstock and it's also got DNA from the donor scion. So right there, we're at a 50-50 shot, right? We don't know whether half the DNA in this seed came from the rootstock or from the scion. Furthermore, where did the pollen come from? 
I'm holding in my hands a Hall avocado. This was on a Hall tree and a female Hall flower was fertilized and it created this piece of fruit. Where'd the pollen come from? I don't know. Did it come from a Choquette? Did it come from a Monroe? Did it come from a Simmons? Did it come from another Hall tree that's in the grove? Or did it come from itself? I have no way of knowing. Another complication, another reason you don't want to use these seeds is because of inbreeding. I just told you avocado trees can self-pollinate. So let's talk about that concept of self-pollination, right? What happens when a tree pollinates itself? It creates a fruit and it creates a seed that lacks genetic diversity. And we know that genet genetic diversity is important for the next generation, right? We know that a baby gets half of its DNA from its dad and half of its DNA from its mom, and that it's not a good thing when the mom and dad are related to each other. Well, in the case of self-pollination, it's not that you have a mother and father that are related to each other. You've got the exact identical DNA. So this seed might lack genetic diversity. And it's further complicated in a commercial grove because behind me right here is a Monroe tree, and next to it is a Monroe. Well, let's say if that Monroe's male flowers fertilize this Monroe's female flowers. That's not self-pollination, is it? Technically, I guess it's not, right? The pollen came from two separate trees, but from a genetic perspective, these two trees, every Monroe in this grove, have all come from the same mother tree. They are genetically identical to each other. So from a genetic perspective, there's really no difference whether this tree fertilized itself or whether this tree was fertilized by any of the other Monroes in this grove or any of the other Monroes in this whole region growing on other farms. So that's why if you want to grow an avocado tree from seed, from the seed of an avocado that you bought in the grocery store, you're taking a risk, you're rolling the dice. We really have no way to know what kind of tree it's going to grow into, what the quality of that fruit will be, what the yield of that fruit will be, when it's going to produce fruit, how often it produces fruit. So that's why I tell people when you plant a tree from seed, you're kind of taking a risk, right? You might get a very healthy tree that produces delicious fruit, but odds are you probably won't. There's too many other combinations that could go into the DNA of this seed that's, that's going to create an unpredictable result. And the worst part about it, you ain't going to find out for seven to ten years because a tree grown from seed, even if it does produce fruit, it takes seven to ten years to produce fruit. Whereas this little guy here, he's only three years old. <laughs> He actually produced fruit out in my nursery earlier this year. I, I clipped it off because I didn't want to grow fruit on this little guy. But at year three, he's already producing fruit. So my recommendation is if you have the time, if you have the space, plant a bunch of seeds. Propagate them into seedlings. Then reach out to me in the springtime. I'm talking to the Department of Agriculture to see if I can maybe clip some scions from my own trees and ship them. The, the Department of Agriculture is a little funny about you know sending agricultural products across state lines and stuff like that. But if I can figure out a way to do it, I'll have them on my website. And you could take your seedlings and graft in scions from Sleep a Lizard Avocado Farm and grow different types of avocados. Now that was a lot of information and I tried to keep it high level, but I think it's plain to see why we as avocado farmers prefer to graft our trees versus growing from seed. You yourself, you can make that decision. If you just want to grow a tree and watch it grow and maybe someday get fruit, then what the heck, roll the dice, grow it from seed. If you want a sure thing, graft your tree. Another sure thing is guacfarm.com. G-U-A-C-F-A-R-M.com, guacfarm.com. That's our website where we sell our sleepy lizard stuff. We got our shirts out there, stickers. When fruit's in season, it's where we sell our fruit. And I really, really appreciate your business. So I'm going to run in and get out of this rain. You go over to guacfarm.com, and I will see you on the next video.